Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to The Infinite Way, where spirituality meets humanity. And it brings me great, great pleasure to introduce our guest, Jill Carlin Butler. Jill Carlin Butler, a successful artist, showcased her India collection in New Delhi in 1992. While in Adipur, India, she lived a magical life, but a moment watching JFK led her to return to Florida to make a community impact. Committed to historic preservation, Jill's art aligns with her cause, notably her house portraits inspired by American art and Indian miniatures. Her activism saved a tree and ignited a love story with environmental architect Lee Porter Butler. Despite Lee's passing, Jill's tirelessly promotes ecotexture, a sustainable living solution for all in the face of climate change. She envisions an eco arc for every family on earth, ensuring safety and comfort without harm to the planet. Jill collaborates globally, planting seeds for affordable housing, energy, and environmental solutions. After 32 years, her vision is closer to realization, echoing Marmonitis' call, if not here, where? If not now, when? If not us, who? Welcome to The Infinite Way, Jill Carlin Butler. Thank you so much, Anolia. It's a pleasure to see you here. It's a pleasure to have you. We're so excited. There's so much that we have to explore here. And knowing that you are an artist and that you bring great, great depth of helping the environment through architecture, let's start off with your art. Let's start off at the core of how did you get started drawing and coming to fruition with your art? My mom was an artist. She just passed a year and a few months ago. She was 104.7, I say. So we were, um, as toddlers, left with the guards at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts while she went to art classes there. She would leave us in the um, English rooms and the guards would watch us, my sister in a baby pram, and my she was younger, and myself toddling around. We toddled around the English house in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in the basement there in those years. And um, so we grew up in the Boston MFA. And art was a big part of our household, um, not just fine arts, not just the painting, but sculpture and we were at the Boston Ballet. I did a lot of paintings of the Boston Ballet at some point in my career. Uh, the Boston Opera, the Sym Boston Symphony. My brother still has season tickets that have been passed down through generations. So culture was a big part that my mother instilled in her children. And Boston's a very cultural place and also a very heady place. So um, that was my upbringing. At school, I had an art teacher who influenced me. I went to Rhode Island School of Design and I got a master's from Boston University in fine arts. But I spent my junior year in France and I spent um, years in Rome, apprenticing with a world famous artist and um, Manzu. And so I had a solid foundation. I got a solid foundation at Beaux-Arts in Paris and at Atelier de la Grande Charmier, and um, also at Atelier Dicette, where I studied printmaking with the English printmaker, Stanley William Hayter. So I had a firm foundation in um, drawing and classics and humanities and all of that. So um, yeah, that's how it's, that's kind of how it started. And you're so humble about it because your work is phenomenal. What are your favorite genres to paint and, and what is your medium? Well, the painting behind you with the people swimming 
with the mm -hmm. architecture arcs in the background is an oil painting. Um, the sort of poster on the side is just acrylics or fabric paint, actually. Um, I, I, I would say all my house portraits that um, we can show are done in a mixed media watercolors, pen and ink, and, um, and gouache. And so I paint in all those media, but I also do community art murals in hand-painted tiles. And I do those for kitchens or bathrooms. And I do hand-painted furniture. So it's like <laughs> whatever surface you've got, I can, I can find a way to paint on it, to decorate it with something lovely. It's so beautiful, so, so beautiful. And then as you grew in your artwork, where did it take you in terms of locations to paint and engage? Well, as you know, I, um, I did a whole book on uh, paintings about India. And so this, this I did in, um, in response as a catalog to the show that I had in 1992 in New Delhi. And so here's me in Jaipur painting at the steps of the palace in Jaipur with the guard who I later painted. I'll show you a painting of him if I can. But um, so I painted a series of 109, 108 paintings in, that were exhibited in Delhi in 92. And um, but I've, I've lived in Europe, I've lived in Paris, I've lived in Rome, and all of those places provided fantastic inspiration for my artwork. So um, these would be, or this would be an oil painting, for example, of a girl in India, and this yeah. would be a gouache and um, watercolor. So they're, they range, they all range in, um, in a variety of um, styles and media. That would be the Taj, the famous Taj, and that yeah. is uh, watercolors and pen and ink. And I don't know if you can see the little dots in the center. Those are the people mm -hmm. right here, right here. Little tiny specks right there. Those are the size of the people. And it's quite extraordinary because that's a tomb. That whole building contains the tomb of Shahad Jahan's beloved wife, Mumtaz. And um, she died after bearing, I think it was 13 children. She rode with him everywhere. And this was his monument to love to his wife. And mm -hmm. that's the, the enormity of it, it's huge. And those are a, a grouping of people. So you can imagine how gigantic it is. So that's his monument to love to his beloved wife. And um, so, yeah, so there, there's paintings I've done of Italy, of France, of South America, where I've traveled and I've lived in a variety of places and stayed. Usually when I go to a place, I usually stay for months on end. So um, that's how I like to go. I like to go and really immerse myself in the culture and paint while I'm there and do, you know, and really study the place and get a feeling for the atmosphere and the environment. So having traveled to Paris and to Italy and to Delhi and to, and to India, they, their culture when it comes to artwork is just extraordinary. It's not even good, it's extraordinary. And to, to know that those are the types of influences, would you, do you have a favorite one? Did your paintings change when you got to the location that you were learning from? I mean, yes. the influences are so, so beautiful and so overwhelming. I mean, it's exciting to me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. So I was 19, I think, when I first went to Paris. Actually, I was much younger when my first time that I went to Paris. I was 16. I went for a summer. And, but when I went to art school in Paris, I, uh, maybe I was, tw I was 20 because I wasn't allowed to work at Atelier 
um, descent until I was 21. And I lied. I told him that I was 21. <laughs> I had to not tell anyone it was my birthday when I turned 21. So um, that was my junior year in college. And um, yes, yeah, so then, then I was really studying form. So I was doing a variety of paintings of, I was in a class called, um, it was an atelier at night, this night school. And there were five models on the model stand that we were all painting. And we had over 62 countries represented in our class. It was like, we had tiers of students. It was really exciting. It was my favorite class. And so, and we were always painting the figure. So I did loads of um, oil paintings, of mm -hmm. figurative oil paintings, studying the, the nude. And um, then when I lived in Rome, I was so influenced by the history, the architecture, the, mm -hmm. the, the story, the beauty, the light, the markets. So all of that stuff I painted. And um, in, in Italy, it was just, I mean, in India, it was eye-opening. That was um, later. And it was just the, it, first I was in Nepal. And so I just, I was supposed to climb a 20,000 foot peak, but I mm -hmm. ended up canceling that trek to just travel with this English photographer and paint the landscapes that wow. we saw. And so that would be, you know, those would be the Himalayas. Himalayas, they be, yes. They would be these incredible villages that no longer exist because of the earthquakes there. That would be Bhaktapur or Kirtapur. And, um, and it was just, that would be Kathmandu. And it was just so exciting to see all of this and to experience not just the beauty of the place, but also the, the culture was so rich. You, it's probably a lot like Africa in that everything is in the street. Yes. And yes. so you have the entire life is just lived right out in the street. And for me, it was this explosion of senses that was just, these are all the letters I wrote home. And that's what this book is called Paintings and Tales, T-A-L-E-S by Jill Carlin. And so these were the, the kind of scenes that I saw and just these are some of the letters that I wrote as well. And so, so I, I, I have to ask this question because each one of these areas have such vastly different energies. Energy yeah. in terms of how you traverse and move in the rhythms of the land. Energies yeah. in the respect of how the people interact with you and, and what, what is meaningful to them. Energies in terms of how they work with their relationships, you know, in, Italians are much more expressive and they speak with their hands and everything's with their hands. And then India is much more reserved and everything is just the flow and the movement of where you're going next. You know, Nepal is just busy, just busy zooming to me. I was in Kathmandu. So for you, how did that energy affect your painting and, and were you able to change with the flow and the rhythms of the land? Did that impact? what you did How well, you um so my experience in nepal was just the opposite was all right okay. i agree with you my uh, i'll get to that in a minute my experience in italy is life is just a joy and mm -hmm. um and the food is so amazing the life mm -hmm. is just that the fact that you spend a couple hours in the middle of the day and you have this sumptuous fabulous meal and you just enjoy so much all of the life just living the life so everything was i i i love italy i i adore italy i adore the lifestyle in europe so i really enjoyed that um in nepal was for me so much calmer than India. And in fact, mm -hmm. those paintings that I just showed you, they're all from Nepal. The India paintings come a little later. But um, what I was going, what my experience was, was while I was in Nepal for six or eight weeks, I met some Australians who had spent some time in India. 
And they sort of warned me about the busyness in India. And so I tried to cancel my trip. I was just going to forget it. I was what they say, going to give it a miss. And I was just going to go to uh, stay in Nepal because I was, I had experienced so much calm in the mountains and so much peace and so much quiet and in the mountains. Now, this is 30 years ago, 30 some odd years ago, 32 years ago. So it was, yeah. so no, 35 years ago. So it was a lot calmer, probably. I was saying one thing that was in Kathmandu that was quite amazing was that you could walk down the street in Kathmandu and you would see these hand painted signs for typewriting schools. And all you would hear as you walked down the street in Kathmandu was typewriters clicking. This is before the internet. Mm -hmm. And in the mountains, they didn't even have credit cards, you know. And I remember when I was in the Annapurna link in, up in the high mountains, uh, there was a there were a lot of Tibetan re refugees. And one lady had we accept American Express here. And I had not seen that throughout, you know, Nepal. So it was the beginning of this commercial wave that sort of has, I'm sure, taken over with yeah. the um, trekkers up Mount Everest and all of that. But India for me was really, um, really intense. Compared to Nepal, it feels like 10 times as intense. And But I had the great fortune of having an introduction to Vicki Oberoi, the owner of the Oberoi Ho Hotel, who just passed away last month. And he and his wife, girlfriend, Mira Jocic, they took me under their arms, under their wings, and they provided the most glorious introduction to India because they took me with them on um, to Pushkar, to the cattle fair wow. Pushkar, where um, we were treated like kings. And um, this is my painting of the cattle fair in Pushkar and there were thousands of thousands of camels there um, all the people bring their camels into Pushkar to the cattle fair to uh, sell them and so that is the scene right there is all those camels and Beautiful. people just spontaneously dancing in the desert this is Jodhpur and that would be um the blue city and these uh -huh. are cities. And so they took me to Rajasthan. They took me to Jaipur. They took me to um, the fort that they were, they were building. They were building out a fort called Nila Fort in, um, in Amber, near Amber Fort in near Jaipur. And so I was with them there and we would see scenes like this. Oh, beautiful. Walking down the street, driving down the street. So India was a very big, expressive, ex very exciting time for me. And um, having met Vicky was really fantastic because it sort of put me in the sphere of the royalty of India. And so I was pals with a lot of royalty, a lot of heads of corporations uh, going to all these parties every night that were with the American press, the international press. I, my friend Patwant Singh, he was a, a famous writer and he always had these intellectual crowd around him who were writers, filmmakers. Um, and he, when people from the States would come, you know, famous people from the States, he would be entertaining them. And I would be at these parties and so it was it was great a great um intellectual and cultural experience and then i could you know go place and stay for one rupee 24 rupees a night at a one dollar a night hotel and yeah. vicky and mira would marvel at me that i trusted people and um and then i had other introductions i had my father was a doctor at harvard and one a colleague of his um, uh, wife, um, a colleague of his daughter was my pen pal. And so I tried to get, in, and also I tried to get in touch with her and it was 
a sort of crazy, incredible story where it was the wrong colleague's name my dad gave me, but he was studying with my yoga teacher who I had gone to visit, um, BKS Iyengar in uh, Pune. Uh -huh. So it was this just serendipitous, incredible, magical experience that one seems to only experience in India, all of the spirituality. I was taken to Allahabad with some people and I was participated in what is called the Kumbh Mela. And the mm -hmm. Kumbh Mela is the largest spiritual gathering in the world. It happens every four years. However, once every 12 years is the big Kumbh Mela. That's the big one. And I was at that one. I met a man who was 300 documented, 300 years old. Um, wow. and, um, and I just had this amazing, I dunked in the Ganges River three times, which is what you do at the Sargon, uh -huh. at the, at the uh, spiritual point where the where the honey, the nectar flows from the sky, basically from the planets to this point. And this is why they all gather there. So I had these amazing experiences. My friend Gayatri Chatterjee, who was teaching film at um, the University of Wisconsin in Varnarsi, and I got to experience Varnarsi with all of these great people to show me around there. So it it just was just such an incredibly rich time in my life and um nothing nothing to to look away from it was amazing it was fabulous and then you experienced meeting the love of your life somewhere i did i did and when i came back from india i met lee and um shortly thereafter our love story ensued and that was in which I asked him to tie me to a tree and um, prevent the tree from getting cut down. I have this here, actually. I don't know if you can see it. We'll see if you can see that painting there. Ah, um, that beautiful piece. So, yeah, so we have this painting there, which um, is is what happened when the when Lee and I met. And um, that's the story of our love affair in which I asked him to tie me to a tree to, to help protect its life. And then we got together and we started um, architecture. So yeah, so that's how that went. We, we had this um, bond and uh, this spiritual meeting and then we, we started the uh, journey of architecture. And so you have to lay the foundation of architecture, which is a phenomenal thing to have birth. He, he was way ahead of his time. So please, please do share. So I have this big poster that I made for when I teach in university and schools and stuff. And um, it explains what architecture is, but the buildings, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. We'll start with his, Lee's first invention, which is the gravity geothermal envelope explained in this plans catalog, Ecosia Homes. Now, Lee was on the cover of Popular Science, Better Homes and Gardens, House Beautiful, many different um, magazines, because he'd invented a way to heat and cool houses without using fossil fuels. That house in Lake Tahoe has never had a utility bill for heating or cooling since, it's in, since it was birthed in 1970 something. 78. So these houses all over the world are um, operate their heating and cooling systems operate without utilizing without um, using fossil fuels, they can be in places like this as well. And so this profound invention was given to Lee by a tree. He um, put his hands under his head and he asked the tree, how is it that you live without having to do anything. You just stand there and all of your resources come to you. And in a flash, the answer came to him and he ran back into his house. He had been trying to figure out how the house that he had built in Meaden, Tennessee was operating. This house here was operating um, warm in the winter. And um, it was the first passive house that he built, passive solar house that he built. 
It had a 40 foot high greenhouse, which is here, beautiful living room like that. And um, this is the greenhouse as well, where he made the discovery of the envelope. And that had been a question he had been trying to solve for many years. And when he got the answer from the tree and what the answer is explained right here, which is the envelope operates, it's a double wall and it encircles the entire house and it connects to the earth at this point below the frost permafrost level. So mm -hmm. in each part of the world, that is at a different, that temperature is constant, but it may be at a different point, um, depending on where you are. And for example, this house is in Long Island, New York. And let's just say that the ground under the ground, the ground level is, let's just say for purposes, it's 60 degrees. So that means, Lee says that the house thinks that it's underground and by natural gravity geothermal convection the air circulates around the house in a natural gravity geothermal loop and the house instead of being say it's 30 degrees outside it becomes a 60 degree house now if you couple that with the south facing greenhouse which is here and so you get the solar gain from the south facing greenhouse and you say you have a washer dryer in your house and you have people in the house that all creates heat as well. So there are various ways that heat occurs within the structure, but the gravity geothermal envelope ensures that it won't be 30 degrees outside or negative two or whatever it might be. So that was his profound invention that started him on the track of trying to figure out a way to um, create a disconnect from the utility grid, to completely disconnect the building from the utility grid. And that's what he ended up doing with the architecture. The building is, that was the next profound invention and that was given to him by dolphins. So he had, um, after, his career was railroaded by the government in 1981. Jimmy Carter had encouraged the solar pioneers, the environmental pioneers to create their works. And there was a, a spirit of uh, learning, inquiry, of uh, development of all of these people that were in the energy loop and figuring out all of these new inventions biodigesters and uh, Lee with the gravity geothermal envelope and various other folks, Nancy and uh, John Todd in, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts with the, um, with the growing and, um, and Bill Mollison in Australia with permaculture. All of this was going on during this era because there was a perceived quote, there was a gas crisis. Um, and so people were yeah, afraid of the quote ran out of fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. this, this catapulted Lee and others to world fame. And two years later, when Ronald Reagan entered the White House, that got squelched immediately. The first thing Reagan did was he took off the solar panels that Lee's friend put on the White House. Many people do not know that during the 70s, there were solar panels on the White House. And so the first thing Reagan did was remove those and continued to destroy the careers of people like my husband, but it never stopped Lee from working. And around 1985, he was in St. Augustine. He had been in San Francisco during the Ecosia Holmes era, but he was in St. Augustine in 1985 and he met Joan Ocean who presented um, at his light center about dolphins and about their incredible connection to the cosmos and right. uh, she swims with the dolphins and and we and I had been swimming with the dolphins and um and so Lee woke up in the middle of the night and he drew the first self-sustaining building which is an arc an eco arc and what makes the building self-sustainable is that they float um, aside from incorporating the envelope, 
but they float. And where do they float? They float on water. And if you notice in the drawing behind me, there's that blue line at the hull of the boat. You know, this I'm going backwards. I can't seem to make my hand go the other way. <laughs> but okay. they 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 it goes the other, it goes this way. So okay. the, the um the this blue line above the word float, that's a water jacket. And that building has a hull, and the hull of that building is floating in a water jacket. So let's just say that this is the land for argument's sake. This line right here is the land. Everything below here is below ground. And that is the floating foundation. This is a jacket of water separating the building from the land. It floats on water like oceans and rivers, but when it's in a landlocked place, you can float these in land. This is a, in the foundation are the entire utility infrastructure, the, the, water, the water tanks, the waste management tanks, the um, rainwater recycling, the electrical storage, all of the, um, the methane storage, the recycle of the black water um, and the utility tanks. And everything above that line is the living space. So, and that living space includes photovoltaic cells and also uh, interior greenhouse so that you can produce all of your own food. So what the EcoArc does is it takes care of all of its own utilities, lights, gas, water, waste management and food production. And it also protects life, no matter what the external conditions, earthquake, flood, fire, tsunami, hurricane, tornado, whatever, because the building floats. So instead of breaking apart in a flood or a, or a tornado or a hurricane, it just rocks, it rocks. And it's aerodynamic as well because of the shape, which is elliptical and because of the material that it is made from, um, which is a new material that has never been used before. And um, it is a fireproof material as well. So Lee used to say one of the reasons to not use wood is because it's not a sustainable resource. So um, all of his buildings are made out of this new material, which includes utilizing recycled, recycled plastics. So that's the, the goal right now is to build these buildings globally and to house all of humanity, to house, we can house all 8 billion of us in safety and comfort during climate change. And it's a question of having the intention. Once humanity has the intention to take care of our brothers and our sisters, and to make sure that everyone on earth has a safe place to live, a safe, comfortable place to live, we can do this. Now, in this first level of designs here, when the bubble fell apart, all of these home, what happened during this era was that Lee um, had, a, it's a plans catalog for 23 locations across America. And they were in these different climatological zones. And Lee made representatives in every one of these locations. Everyone that built a house became a representative of his, of his buildings. So every building that was constructed, potentially 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 buildings were built in that same uh, location because the people that built the first ones became the representatives for the spread of this idea. But like I say, unfortunately it became, it was cut off, but that's the plan again. And so we can, we can house everyone on earth and in a safe and comfortable building. I think I was telling you that I was in Peru in 2016 or 17. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I was um, in a ghetto and in Lima, I think it was called Remac. And um, it occurred to me at that time that everybody 
has to have a way, they have to have a, they get to have a um, teaching mechanism to and a, a test that they have to take to live in these houses. So they have to know how to interact with the houses because these buildings are all interactive. And by the way, uh, this illustration is not necessarily for one building. This could be an entire city. Exactly. And I wanted to go there with you and talk about how it could actually be a community, a city, you know, multiple buildings. It does not have to reside with just the home. Right. So it can, it, it, it is all just a mathematical equation. And now we have supercomputers that can do the algorithms that can figure out exactly what is required to make it a community as opposed to just a single building. Individuals may want to build these buildings individually so that they have a safe home to live in. But in addition to that, we are able to build entire communities. We can build as big or as small as one desires. And it's really just a, an equation. So all of this is in the future. And this is what we're planning to do. And we're So I, I want to talk happen. about the fact that Lee was so far ahead of his time because this is something that we've been aspiring to. And what happens is that we go through a crisis. Everyone cries out, oh, we need to change something. We need to fix it. We need to fix it. How are we going to do that? What is the question? So on and so forth. And here it is. Here it is where it is a discipline of how we choose to live. And like you said, right? You need to know how to interact. You need to know that you can grow your own food and how that cycle of growing goes that we can uh, deal with our waste treatment and how that cycle of waste treatment goes and that we don't throw things on mother earth or anything else, that everything has a purpose and everything can be disposed of and that that disposal actually can fuel the next thing. Yes, it's not a disposal, it's actually a utilization. Right. So the waste is utilized within the closed loop system. So um, instead of being something you want to discard, it's something that's useful for methane gas, for example, or for cooking, or for a liquid fertilizer for fertilizing your garden. So everything within the system is can be reutilized. And I, I really want to even go into depth with that so that people understand. So in, in waste management, and I lived with an environmental engineer for, for, for 30 years, so I understand this. And like when we look at landfills, landfills are usually lime, right? They don't interact directly with just being dumped in a big hole in the ground. They're lime because they, they, you don't want that waste to go into the groundwater. So they're lime. And what happens is that as that waste breaks down, it produces a gas and that gas is methane. And that methane is usually aired out and just released into the environment. And you go, oh, what's that smell when you pass the landfill? It's the methane from the breakdown of the waste. So what you're basically saying is that that methane can be captured and turn around and fuel the cooking and, and, and things that you wanna do cooking wise, right? Mm -hmm. And then the cooking other and, breakdown. And fertilizer. Right, cooking and fertilizer. And then the, the breakdown of the food actually produces compost and that compost can turn around and fertilize your garden because you have a greenhouse in. And I, I just, I want people to grasp this when you say all encompassing because we were saying, oh, well, how do we get food? Oh, well, how do we deal with waste management and, and water? Okay, um, share a little bit more about the water. Well, everybody, it's well known that we can easily collect rainwater. Right. This is like a well-known system. We can easily desalinize ocean water. Mm -hmm. These are all known technologies. Lee used to say that all he was was an architect and he just picked off the shelf. He said, by the time that we were ready to do this, all of this technology would be readily available off the shelf technology. And that's basically what we're doing. We're taking the best of each one of the systems and we're incorporating it into the system. We're taking the best of the recycled waste products. We're taking the best of the aquaponics. We're taking the best of the hydroponic people. We're taking the best 
of the computerized greenhouses. We're taking the best of the solar windows. We're taking the best of the water reclamation systems. All of these systems we can incorporate into this one technology. It, that's why it's architecture integrated technologies. This is an integrated system. This system integrates all of the technologies, the best ones that are on earth today. We're going to put them in this pot and we're going to make this stew that is going to help survive all humanity to survive in comfort and safety and also give us all sovereignty. We're all living in tyranny and we don't want to live under the rule of whomever. Right now, we're under the rule of the oil corporations. We get all of our fuel to, to toast our toast. Some young man has to go to war somewhere so we can get the oil, just so that we can turn on the electricity. We want to be independent. Everyone on earth wants to be sovereign. They don't want to have to bow to a dictator. They, people want their sovereignty. They want their freedom. And maybe they want it within their community, their religious rights to be able to practice their religions together and their, their social rights to live the way they want to live socially. Maybe that's what creates community. People that are doing their spiritual practice together, their social practices together, whatever it might be, they can create communities that are sovereign, that don't have to interfere with anyone else because as long as you have something and I don't have that thing the potential is that I might want to go over there and kill you to get that thing and that's what happens on our earth unfortunately but that's how it goes people are need, need have needs and when those needs are not being met they find a way to get those things and usually it's not through the, it, it can be through some nefarious ways. Yeah. So we want to be able, if we want to create peace on earth, we have to, this is foundational for peace on earth. It's not guaranteeing it because a man might sleep with another guy's wife and it might cause, you know, a rift. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, sexual jealousy is a big issue that must be dealt with. And these are the social consequences. However, if we start foundationally with giving humanity their basic needs, water, food, and shelter, families can live in peace potentially. This is why I say ecotecture is foundational. It's the root chakra, the red root chakra of the seven chakras that we talk about. That is foundational how we interact with the earth, how we live with each other, where the shit goes, excuse me, but exactly where the shit goes. I, and I, I love it. You really summed it up. I, I, I know we're coming up on the hour. I hate to even let you go, but if you had one last word that you could share with the public regarding ecotecture and one breath, and then anything you wanted to share to the artists, that are up and coming also because you bring such a plethora of, of skills to the, to the table. And it's imperative that all sides hear from you. So dreams do come true. Just dream it and then take the steps to live your dream. And the dolphin dream in ecotecture is a dream for all of us. It's not just my dream. There's not anyone on earth who hears it who doesn't want to embrace this dream for themselves. So dream along with me and make this thing a reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Analia, to share with your audience. I'm so um, humbled to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. And we are going to have Jill's bio in our description field as well as being able to contact Jill. And um, also you can get to Jill through me. Also, if you contact me, I will make sure that anything that needs to get to Jill is passed through. So thank you, Jill Carlin Butler. Thank you for all of the beautiful skills that you bring to humankind and all of the contributions that you make. And 
Lee's dream, making it real and making it come to fruition. It is so needed and it is so right. So oh, thank, thank you. you again. And this has been another episode of The Infinite Way, where spirituality meets humanity. Take care and bye-bye, everyone.